Hey, this is Rod Cleef, and you are listening to the Mailbox Money Show with Bronson Hill. Welcome to the Mailbox Money Show. I'm your host, Bronson Hill. I have a special guest, and I have a guest host with me today as well. And they're both, their names are both Joseph. So we've got, uh, first, my co host, we've got Joseph Coleman, who works with Bigger Pockets, who's been a good friend for years and uh, just really provides a great analyst uh, response to a lot of different topics, can speak intelligently about many, many things. Welcome, Joe. How's it going, man? Great. Great. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Love it, man. I love it. Um, and then our guest today, we have uh, Joe Brown, who is with Heresy Financial. And I have just tremendous respect for Joe because he has, uh, just, he, he speaks on just about every topic intelligently. So when we talk about uh, what's happening, longer term inflation, shorter term deflation, that's a topic we want to get into. We talk about central bank digital currency. We talk about a lot of trends that are happening. What are the risks that are out there? A lot of stuff we talk about, this is this show is really dedicated to passive investors. But again, if in 2008, 2009, you were not paying attention to what was happening in the macroeconomic sphere, you got absolutely destroyed. And I know many, many people that lost everything or lost a lot by not really paying attention. So that's why we have conversations like this. And I really hope uh, it's, it's going to be a great conversation. So um, Joe Brown, welcome, man. Why don't you give us a quick little intro about you and what you're doing and your channel and, and how you're adding value to the space, man. Love it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, very quick intro into uh, into what got me in, interested in all this and uh, where I am. When uh, when my wife and I got married, we were in a really bad financial situation. And so I knew I needed to do something to try and uh, dig myself out of the hole that uh, we were in. So I started reading books, just like basic personal money management, finance type stuff, like getting out of debt, budgeting stuff. And uh, it just grabbed my interest. I, I kind of fell in love with uh, with the topic. So I had a buddy who was a stockbroker. So I was talking to him about trying to you know learn how I should invest. And he was like, look, like if you enjoy this stuff, I can actually you know help you get a job um, in get you into the broker training program. So he did that. And that's when I kind of just uh, you know, dove head first into the industry and uh, really loved it. I did a bunch of different jobs as much as I could get like different angles on uh, on my roles so that I could understand how the machine worked. That was always kind of the driving uh, motivation behind it. I wanted to get into different roles to understand how the economic machine worked from inside of the belly of the beast. Um, eventually got to a point though where i started kind of like hitting brick walls and realizing that um I, there were you know explanations that were lacking and uh throughout the different uh you know one example is like getting licensed uh you know a bunch of my different licenses that i got i realized hey you know what a lot of the stuff that we have to sell to people is because of um you know basically it comes from the top down the government is telling us we have to we have to do it this way and so a bunch of americans are investing in a way simply because the government says it has to be that way. Um, and so I started researching and learning how economics worked from an outside point of view and um, uh, got introduced to Austrian economics, people like Peter Schiff and Ray Dalio and uh, kind of um, more outside perspectives that were a little bit uh, different. Um, and it got to a point where I realized, hey, you know what, this is the way the economy works. Um, the ma vast majority of the industry is trying to sell people things that don't align with the, the way that things actually work. So I was like, you know what, I'd like to uh, go out and try and educate people about how the way money really works um, so that they can, uh, you know, invest better, make more money, keep more money. So um, that's when I started Heresy Financial. And that was about three and a half years ago now. And, um, and so I've been doing that uh, ever since. You know, it's amazing. I think it's so true. Um... My background was medical device sales. I know Joe Coleman, you've been in sales as well, but in the financial space, it seems like everybody's trying to sell you something, right? And I always, mm -hmm. I tell people that are in the space, just be aware that every person, even, you know, we, we do deals. So we're, we're also not completely unbiased. So, um, you know, it's just, it's rare to find voices like yours. And that's why, you know, we hear about the Wall Street voices or the big media, whatever, but a lot of this is so subsidized by Wall Street and other big money that there's no chance to independently think. And so I love that you're pulling things apart. Um, I know there's a lot we can talk about. Let's talk, let's just jump right in here. Talk to us about uh, deflation, cash disappearing, uh, what's happening short-term, what's happening long-term. There's a lot happening on that side. Are we in recession? Just give us some, some let's jump in, wherever you want to take that. 
Yeah. Okay. I'll start off with like a uh, an, a uh, uh, an example of the way that an economy works using kind of a, a caricature of a small local economy. Let's say we've got a little Wild West town. We've got a bank uh, that stores everybody's gold. They issue paper receipts uh, that are redeemable for that gold. And people use those paper receipts as money. So people buy and sell horses, build each other houses. You've got a shoemaker. You've got somebody that you know has an apple tree, You know whatever. You've got the whole local isolated little economy here. Um, everybody does uh, money this way because it's safer. They don't have to worry about somebody coming in and stealing their gold. Um, it's more convenient. You can have a piece of paper that represents a very small amount of gold. So you can make transactions for a sandwich instead of, uh, you know, one ounce of gold being a down payment on a house or whatever it might be. So that's how people use money. But eventually the banker realizes nobody's ever turning these paper receipts in and redeeming them for the gold. Um, and so they're like, hey, look, I've got an opportunity to make some money here because nobody's ever come back and getting gold from me. So the banker, instead of just being a savings institution, they open up a new line of business called loans. And they say, anybody who wants a loan can come get a loan from me. Now, the way that loans work, it's supply and demand, right? So I can go borrow from Aunt Sally, but uh, in a purely free market like that, uh, borrowers and lenders, they're competing with each other. So if Aunt Sally says, you can you can borrow from me, but I want 5%, um, I may or may not actually uh, engage in that loan. So the banker looks at this and says, I've got a pile of gold in my vault. It's not mine. It represents free money for me though, if I start loaning it out. So I'm going to look at everybody else's interest rate. Aunt Sally wants 5%. Uncle John wants 4%. I'm going to offer 3.5%. That way, anybody who wants a loan comes to me. It's free money for me. And so he doesn't care about being, you know, undercutting the interest rate. And so somebody comes up to him and says, yeah, absolutely. That's a great price on a loan. So I want uh, I want that uh, interest rate. So uh, somebody comes and gets a 3.5% loan. So I write him the exact same piece of paper that everybody has as money. Here's your, here's your loan. You owe that back to me plus three and a half percent. It's a great deal. So everybody comes and borrows. Now, what that does is it inflates the money supply. So people start spending that money. He borrows to fix his roof. Somebody else borrows to buy a new pair of shoes. Somebody else borrows to buy a you know, down payment on a house, whatever it is. So now more money is getting spent. More money is getting spent. That means more people have more income than they would have otherwise. Because without those loans, that spending wouldn't have happened. So that income wouldn't have been there. So it has this upward spiral effect where everybody has more income than they start spending more because they spend more. Now more people have more income and there's this boom for a while. Everybody's really happy. And then what everybody realizes is prices get too expensive because of this boom. It causes inflation. Prices go up. There's this bidding up of prices of goods and services as that money works its way throughout the economy. The other thing that people didn't realize was this new spending was built on debt that expanded the money supply. So that first person who borrowed money that they have got to pay that back. <laughs> so eventually they take their income, turn around and give it back to the bank. Now there's less money. And so the income that somebody else was expecting now doesn't happen because he took some of his income and repaid it. So the money supply shrank. Now that spiral up effect reverses itself and crashes yeah. back down. Right. And so now you have less and less income, less and less money, prices come back down. The hiring that took place, the research, the investment that took place, it was all built on this false assumption of prices going up that was from credit causing money to expand. And now it reverses itself and we get the bust. So a couple of things that this uh, caricature explains is that number one, booms are built on the artificial expansion of the money supply, which is enabled by credit expansion, e artificially easy credit conditions. Number two, the bust always follows the boom. And then number three, the damage is actually done during the boom when all the misallocation of resources happens, when the false, when the uh, incorrect actions are taken. And the bust is just the realizing of it. Um, the other thing it shows is that with the actual uh, hard tie on money, this gold standard, um, the boom happens, but then eventually you do get that collapse back to where it was before because the debt gets repaid. Um, now we fast forward to today and we see a lot of similarities between that story and what's going on, right? The Fed lowered interest rates, printed a bunch of money, we got this boom, and now we're starting to see these, th these things unwind and we're looking ahead into this bust. But people are thinking, well, we got the Fed, they can always print more money, right? And that's true, but if they do, inflation keeps on going, then you get hyperinflation, then you get a collapse of the currency. 
The Fed knows this and they don't want that to happen. So when you look at what they've done with the money supply, it actually looks very similar to if they were pretending they had gold in the vault. So looking at a chart of the money supply, anybody can Google this. Just look at the M2 money supply. It peaked in April of 2022. So it peaked and it's been collapsing, not collapsing, but it's been shrinking ever since then. So there's less money in the system now than there was then. It's been collapsing or been shrinking for a while now. Um, So it looks very similar to this boom bust cycle. So you say, okay, well, why haven't prices started to shrink yet, started to go down yet? Where's the deflation been if the money supply has been shrinking this this long? And the answer is there is a lag effect. So look at how long it took the prices to go up from the point at which they started printing money. They started printing money March of 2020. Mm -hmm. We got a drop in the inflation rate. And then the inflation rate didn't reach the same place it was at for the five years prior until March of 2021. Then the inflation rate skyrocketed from there. So it took a year for it just to get back to normal and then for the inflation to set in. So the uh, uh, money supply peaked in April, 2022. So it's been a little longer than a year since the money supply started to shrink. So 16, 18 months is not an unrealistic amount of time to see go by before prices actually start to move down. Um, And so the boom bust cycle is something that's built into the economy. If they didn't allow the bust to happen, then you get the hyperinflation. Money supply is not expanding right now. So I anticipate we have deflation short term. Now we have inflation long term after that, which we can get into. But the the short term look ahead, I see deflation. Yeah, that makes sense. Joe Coleman, I know you had a question you were going to ask about uh, basically debt and kind of history, historical times of monetizing debt or what the options are from here. Can you talk about that? Well, I I would say, do you mind if I ask a a quick question before we kind of route into that? Okay. So Joe, I'm curious because you're talking about debt cycles and there can be inflationary or deflationary debt cycles. I'm curious like mm-hmm. why you think this would be a deflationary debt cycle because the Fed could just continue to ramp up um you know spending and support the treasury with excessive uh deficits that continue into the future. Why do you see this being deflationary instead of an inflationary um recession or debt cycle? Yeah, you're absolutely right. They could. So far, they're not. So that's why I'm making that call. So I'm just looking at what they're doing, what the money supply is doing, what credit is doing, and making my uh, forecast based off of that. If the Fed comes out tomorrow and says, you know, hey, we're lowering rates. Uh, Hey, we're going to switch from quantitative tightening to quantitative easing. We're going to, you know, X, Y, and Z. Then absolutely, then I'm going to, then I'm going to shift. And so I think it actually will get there. Um, I just think that's further off in the future than most people anticipate since, um, I don't remember the exact time frame, but when they were printing all the money, everybody said it would continue. Then they started saying, the Fed started saying, Hey, we're going to stop printing money. And everybody said, no, you're not. And then they actually stopped printing the money. And everybody said, you'll have to start printing money again soon. And they said, Nope, we're going to, we're going to stop printing money. And then we're actually going to lower our balance sheet. And everybody said, you can't lower your balance sheet. You can't raise interest rates. And when they started doing that, everybody said, you're going to pivot soon. And they still haven't pivoted. And so the federal reserve for the last, however many years has been as intentional as they can be about signaling what they're going to do in the future so they don't surprise markets. The only time they surprise markets is to bail it out when there's an immediate crisis that needs it. Other than that, they want to give Wall Street a huge advance notice of what they're going to do. Um, and so far, they've stuck to it. And they've all, that since for the last year and a half, they've been a so, lot more hawkish. Than Joe, I got one thought on that real quick because that, yeah. that did happen where they were zero interest or we're good, we're good, we're good. And for the foreseeable future, this was before they started raising rates, you know, and then and then pretty quickly they said, oh, actually, no, we actually need to start raising rates. And that happened very quickly. There was a there was a turn from, hey, we're keeping things low to raising. I think what what year this would have been like end of 2021, early 2022, where they were, you know, rates were super low or COVID. We need more support, whatever. And they said, you know, foreseeable like forecast from what I remember was we're going to keep it low for a long time. And then they just suddenly they did pivot very suddenly. So is that also like a, or am I, am I misunderstanding how they communicated that maybe? Yeah. So in the beginning, when they were saying, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates, right, they're, right, right. Yeah. they're, they, they communicate when they think that that will happen. Um, and that was communicating, Hey, it won't happen for a long time. But when you just look at what they were saying, 
it moved from that to now we're talking about it and then we're probably going to start doing it soon. And so it was at least a couple of months. It was right. a couple of meetings um, to give the market uh, time to anticipate it. Sure. Um, and so, but you're right. Before they started thinking about thinking about it, they were signaling that was going to be, you know, two years or so. Yeah, and right. it happened much sooner than that, but they still gave as much advance notice as they could. They didn't, they didn't say we're not thinking about, we're not even thinking about it. And then the next meeting, oh yeah, we just did it. Yeah. Do you think like, what is the, like, what's that moment? And we've talked about this before, but you know, what's that moment where the Fed says, oh gosh, like we actually have a crisis here and we've got to pivot because it's been said that, you know, they'll, they'll stay this way. They'll keep going with higher rates until inflation comes down or something breaks. And we saw yeah. that a little bit with the financial system where, you know, a Silicon Valley bank, several, I think there's been several hundred small banks that have failed this year. We don't really hear about, but what, what's the thing that we, you know, of course we're concerned those in real estate or other things like, man, this is painful to go from like almost zero interest rate to raise like 5%, you know, base interest rate that quickly. Um, you know, what, what is the event that you could see happening where that mm -hmm. changes or do they just hold for the next two, three years and they just let some carnage happen and say, okay, well, that's what we wanted. Yeah. Good question. Uh, post COVID monetary policy is very different than it was, uh, uh, pre. So we take a look at a good example is the end of 2018. Uh, the federal reserve was raising interest rates. They were finally trying to make good on their promise from the financial crisis. They would, that they would unwind their balance sheet at some point. Um, and so they were letting assets bleed off their balance sheet. They were raising interest rates. And then the market started to break. If you remember at the end of 2018, uh, Trump was tweeting at Powell for crashing the markets and, uh, markets were, were, were starting to crash. Um, the economy couldn't handle it. And so what did the federal reserve do? They pivoted. There was, there was nothing in the system that prevented them from pivoting and going back to a broadly stimulus, uh, a broad-based broad you know, stimulative monetary policy. Um, inflation was, uh, the official inflation rate was extremely low at that time. So they didn't have a reason. Um, now, uh, inflation is like embedded in the system. It's like you do one thing wrong and boom, inflation reignites. It's like oil is bounced off its bottom. Gas prices are starting to go up again. So we've got, we've got these little, like, uh, uh, the, if you like a forest fire, everything is dry. There's a ton of dead wood and there's little tiny brush fires and the, the federal reserve is like running around. They don't want to cause a flood, uh, but they're, they're, they're trying to not reignite this, uh, forest fire of inflation. And um, and so the way that we've seen them respond that I say is different than pre-COVID is very isolated um, uh, bailouts, if you will. So right. the banks failed and instead of resorting to QE or lowering interest rates, they coordinated very isolated uh, scalpel-like bailouts. So they said, okay, just the depositors are yep. gonna be bailed out. Um, and shareholders aren't, and we're not even going to make a promise that this is for any other bank, but we're going to vaguely allude to the fact that it would be if the bank was systemically important. And so um, they're, they're, they've been much more targeted with, uh, with their approach uh, with the bank term uh, funding program, their new facility for that specific purpose. Um, and so the, to answer the question of what would be the catalyst thing, because that wasn't it, um, that would cause them to kind of pivot in reverse course. Um, I think they'll continue to try and be laser focused, but uh, they'll they'll spill over when the government fiscal policy needs them. Um, and so that's the long term uh, risk that will tip us back over into inflation is the unsustainable path we're on with fiscal policy, where we have interest rates higher than they've been in 22 years. Um, the federal deficit exploding, the national debt exploding, and the cost of the interest alone on the debt quickly becoming the largest line item on the budget and that not slowing down at any point in the future. We probably have about a year left of the government borrowing at the current rates before interest rates on government debt start to explode because there's just no more money out there for them to borrow at those current rates. And wow. then we maybe have a year or two left after that until they just won't be able to borrow to pay off what they what they have to have to fund. And that point, the Fed will have to step in. And if they don't, the Federal Reserve Act will get rewritten by Congress. Oh, so, so, so that's a question then too. Um, and I know Joe Coleman, you had this in your questions you're going to ask, but about monetizing the debt. Um, is that then a real possibility? Then they just start 
throwing money at it saying, well, if we can't find the money to borrow, we're just going to, you know, give it to ourselves and, and just create more currency and, and monetize it. Yeah. So right now, the when we talk about the Federal Reserve's independence, that's the separation of monetary policy from fiscal policy. And right. so um, during like 2020, you heard Powell come out a lot and say, we'll we'll print the money, but it's up to Congress to spend the money uh, in a way that will, you know, they decide is most helpful. Now what they're saying is like, if you are, it wasn't this last meeting, it was the meeting before it. Um, somebody asked, they said, Hey, we all understand federal government's on an unsustainable path with fiscal policy. Is there any chance the Fed comes in and uh, helps refinance the U.S. government's debt? And Jerome Powell said three words. He said, under no circumstances. That's it. No explanation, nothing more. Uh, it was like it gave me chills. And so the, what, what I, I'm not exactly sure what he was saying there. There's two possibilities. Possibility number one is that um, he was just saying, no, the Federal Reserve by law cannot do that because real uh, uh, monetizing the debt is the Fed prints money, gives it directly to the government uh, in the form of a loan. That does not happen. It's never happened. It cannot happen. It goes through the banking system. So the government has to issue debt uh, to the public, and then the Fed can buy that debt from the open market. Now, that's a loophole. It's not really a distinction other than the, the, you know, the letter of the law. Um, but uh, definitely violates the spirit of the law. So he might have just been saying, no, we cannot actually do that direct fi refinance of the government's debt. Um, the other thing he may have been implying, which he's hinted at a little bit uh, in the past, is that um, central banks around the world have realized they funded too much government spending and they caused this, uh, this debt spiral to go out of control. And now they're saying, we are not going to do that in the future. Even if the government gets itself into trouble and has to borrow at higher rates, can't afford things, has to cut spending. That's the government's job. We're independent from that. We're monetary policy. That's fiscal policy. They got to figure out a solution to their own issues. If that was his uh, meaning, what is going to happen is the government will get into trouble. The Fed will say, no, we're not going to QE. We're not going to lower rates. We're not going to bail you out. Then Congress will be forced, in my opinion, what they will do is rewrite the Federal Reserve Act. And they will say, you are no longer there for maximum employment. You are no longer there for stable prices. You are there to fund the federal government. You are there to monetize the debt. Um, either that or they will just fold the Fed underneath the Treasury and take control over monetary policy and we will no longer have that distinction. And again, the result would be money printing for all uh, for all expenses. But if we don't have that, then the result will be a massive deflationary death spiral, um, which I don't think anybody would let happen. I think one way or another, the Fed's going to come in uh, and print for the government again. Yeah. That's great. I'm sorry, my uh, had a little connection issues here, but I think we're we're good. Joe Joe Coleman, uh, why don't you jump? Yeah, well, I'd love to piggyback piggyback off of that. Um, so, this is the first time that I'm aware of where, and maybe there's some clarification that has to happen in this question because you're saying that the Fed, the Federal Reserve, is not funding the deficit, but um, effectively. My my understanding is they are doing that. They're they're buying. Uh, they, their balance sheet is huge with treasuries and mortgage backed securities as well. Um, and so it seems like no, number one, they they are funding the deficit. Would you disagree with that, or it's just not through direct means? They're not doing it right now. They certainly have in the past. Uh, and so every time their balance sheet is going up. What they're doing is they're printing money. They're using that new money to buy a government treasury off the market. What that bank does then, the bank that the Fed bought it from, they sell that treasury to the Fed. They get that cash in return. Then the bank, what the bank normally does is they take that cash, they turn right back around and buy a new treasury, which is loaning that cash to the government. So banks operate as the middleman between the Federal Reserve and the federal government to get the printed money to them in the form of a loan. Now, that has happened in the past. And every time the government, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet moves up, that's exactly what's happened. That is not happening right now. If we look at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, it is going down. So what that means is the Federal Reserve is letting some of that debt get paid off. So they're actually doing the opposite of funding the deficit. Um, the government is having to borrow money in tax 
pay off old debt and they're not getting on net new dollars entered into the system for them to be able to borrow. So right now the Federal Reserve is not funding the Federal Reserve's deficit, even indirectly. They're, the they're treasuries. doing the opposite. Got it. So, so the way you describe it, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we went through this period where the Fed is buying up all of these assets, right? Primarily treasuries. And then they reached a peak and they started to level off. That's what you talk about, money going out of the system. Mm -hmm. And so they were for a period of time. And then now they're doing the opposite. Um, do you know of a time in history? Because I know you're a student of history and you're interested in history of money and debt and all of this, where something like this has happened in the past. I you know, I know like in Roman times where the, they had a gold coin and it slowly and slowly became um, filled with other metals and less and less gold over time. But curious with the situation today, if there's any analogs that you see throughout history or in other countries, or even if you look at Japan, like how do you even compare our situation? Are there any good analogs that you have or ideas about how this could shake out based on the past? Yeah, absolutely. So there's there's pieces of it that you can say, okay, these you know couple of things uh, look like it did then. Um, All together, you know, anytime you start to do that, you're going to come to you know, hey, this this is uh, unique in history. But certainly, there are absolutely pieces of this. One of the things that's uh, um, when when you're studying history, like there's this great book called um, When Money Dies. Uh, I believe it's by Adam Ferguson. That's it describes it, it, it is, um, and it describes the uh, the fall of the Weimar Republic, the hyperinflation that happened in Germany. And um, it is uh, it's really interesting reading that book because you you come away with this feeling like almost like man, this happened so quickly. Uh, and what you don't realize is, uh, unless you're kind of trying to pay attention to it, this unfolds over the course of many years. And so uh, when we take a look at what has happened with monetary policy and fiscal policy in the United States just since uh, the beginning of 2020, it's only been a little over three years, uh, but there have been so many massive, uh, massive things that have taken place, so many massive changes, so the increase of the money supply. So we have to take a look at things and say, okay, yeah, um, historically, we can take a look at some similar things like the Weimar Republic in Germany, what happened in 1929, what happened in the 40s here, what happened in the 70s here. Um, and uh, we can we can say there's so many similar things, but they unfold over a longer period of time. And so while you might see you know financial crisis on the horizon, that doesn't mean it's happening tomorrow. Um, in fact, it could take a very long time for, uh, for some of these things to unfold. Um, one of the one of the similarities to be a little bit more direct is uh, is the folding of uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy. So pretty much every time throughout world history, when you look at a government that has a central bank, um, many times they do start off somewhat independent. Uh, the degree of independence uh, varies from place to place throughout history. But over the last three, four hundred years, we can look at pretty much all the all the central banks that have have started, and they're 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 somewhat separate. And whenever you have a nation that gets to uh, a similar position where the United States is in right now, where you have uh, ballooning deficits. Um, those deficits funded by borrowing, uh, the borrowing um, funded over a long period of time um, with bouts of uh, easing from the central bank, um, and then a uh, debt to GDP ratio that exceeds 90%, um, where you have, uh, yeah, exceeds 90%. A lot of these, a lot of these factors get to a place where eventually you're like, okay, the money's been spent already. So moving forward, we have to decide, are we going to deleverage through deflation or deleverage through inflation? Because the deleveraging is going to happen either way because we leveraged up. So we've already spent that, that future purchasing power. Um, if they stay independent, they're ratcheting up interest rates. So it makes debt more painful. So you get debt uh, defaults and you get payoffs and you get prices collapse. Uh, that's how it was uh, handled in the aftermath of uh, the depression in 1920 and 1921. Uh, they raised interest rates, the government balanced the budget. It was extremely economically painful, but it only lasted 18 months. And then we had the roaring 20s after that. Um, instead, of, uh, instead of that, if they decide, hey, we're gonna do the opposite 
and uh, try and ease the pain, you get like what happened in 1929, where uh, they they tried to ease the pain. Government started spending a lot more, and the Great Depression actually lasted, you know, 20 years instead of uh, 20 months. Um, and so we can find corollaries throughout history. Um, and then finally, the melding of uh, central banks with central governments, monetary policy and fiscal policy coming together. That happens quite frequently throughout history. And that's usually when the central bank tries to do things that are healthier long term for the country. Uh, and the politicians who are in power want something that's short term, more beneficial. So they meld the two, take control of printing press and, um, and, and do things. And then you get things like Lebanon, Turkey, uh, Venezuela, uh, Argentina, Zimbabwe, those kind of uh, right. examples. A lot, of, a lot of challenges there. Hey, a couple more questions for you. I know we, you've got so many uh, good things to share about a lot of topics. Um, this is a hot topic for a lot of people, especially with Fed now coming out recently. Um, you know, the idea of, of the uh, payment system that can go you know, 24 hours a day through not through the banking system. Uh, there's, there's split opinions on this. Um, I know you uh, well, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on central bank digital currency. Uh, is it coming? When is it coming? And is cash going away? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so I'd like to start off by saying that I think a central bank digital currency is a tyrant's wet dream. It's something that Stalin and Mao and Hitler and they would have just uh, absolutely loved this because it is a tool that has such potential for uh, totalitarian control uh, over over a nation um, that uh, that they would just be you know drooling over a, over a CBDC. It used to be in the past, like if you wanted uh, you know communist or fascist or totalitarian authoritarian rule over a nation, then you had to establish committees, you had to establish boards, have oversight, you have to have a bunch of people planning and deciding the flow of resources in an economy. And um, slowly over the past couple of decades, what it seems like central planners have realized is that um, if you uh, that that money is half of every transaction, right? Every half of everything everybody does. You go on a date, you live at home, you you drive somewhere. Like everything everybody does, the other half of that transaction is money flowing one way. So if you can control the money, then you essentially can control everything that happens in an economy. And the, to the greater extent you control the money, the more control you have over literally everything that happens. You can cause behaviors to happen and stop wow. behaviors from happening. Um, and so when you have a physical cash system where like we, you know, just think of like a commodity money system where there's no ability to track the money, there's no ability to control the money. Like two people meet up and swap a good for a commodity money. It's like, there is zero control over that. Um, and so the more you move to a digital system, uh, the more uh, control you can uh, exercise over, over the flow of resources. Um, you can institute real-time taxes, real-time rations. You can essentially, when I talk about the merging of monetary and fiscal policy, this is one of those things. You don't need the IRS to write a, you know thousands or hundreds of thousands of stimulus checks. You press you, you pre a few keys on the keyboard and just deposit the funds into people's accounts. You see a bubble uh, taking place in one area of the stock market with NFTs or with, uh, you know, uh, um, like GameStop, AMC, whatever, you know, the, the meme stocks that were happening in 2020 and 2021. Um, essentially, you could just say, okay, no more purchases can be made for things like this for the next two weeks to stop a bubble. Or no more shorts can happen on this thing to stop a crash. Um, you, you essentially exert control over every transaction, which means you control everything that happens. Um, so I, I, I think it's absolutely dangerous. But you can see why that means that it will probably happen um, because of the power that that gives pe uh, the people in power to have uh, to incentivize people to take it. So already looking at the rails right now, Fed now, that's the kind of the phase one, stage one, getting the infrastructure built into the banking system for a CBDC. Um, you, you can see why everybody's incredibly okay with this. It's like, finally, dollar transactions are catching up to free market uh, alternatives. It's like, you can have instant payments that settle in real time. It's like, <laughs> why hasn't that been here before? Uh, and so it, there's there's very uh, uh, 
logical and uh, like duh type of uh, benefits that come with even just this phase one that people are like, absolutely, you know, Fed now is great. Um, now, just imagine they come out and next time and say, you know, there's a big crisis. Hey, we want to give everybody universal basic income for a year to deal with this crisis. But last time we gave you stimulus checks, you went out and caused toilet paper shortages. You caused gas shortages. You caused inflation. You uh, spent a bunch of money on these bubbles that turned out to be scams. You put all your money in NFTs. We want to protect you from the, all of that. So if you want to get your universal basic income, you have to sign up for, you know, an account directly with the Fed. We'll deposit the money there. Um, and everybody's going to be like, well, I can't afford my groceries and feed my family, or I accept this hand handout. I don't care if it comes with a handcuff. I need to feed my family. Um, and so you can see very easily how people will uh, gravitate towards something like this. And so I think it will uh, happen as long as they time it right with a bad enough uh, crisis, which I think they will. Yeah, that's interesting. Joe Coleman, do you anything you want to add here? I think there's some great thoughts there. Well, I'm curious. I, I've heard a lot about central bank digital currencies. And one of my, it's kind of a dumb question, but you hear about, you know, cryptocurrencies and that it's decentralized, right? There's a shared ledger. And then you have the dollar, which for the most part, it, like on my phone, everything's digital when I send payments anyways. Um, Joe, could you share a little bit more about like, what would that look like from a practical perspective? Like for me, if I wanted to send money to a friend, am I using a different payment system for that? I'm just really curious yeah. about like what what do you envision that looking like? Yes, great question. So uh, to explain the ledger system real quick, it's literally just a list. Um, think of an Excel spreadsheet where it has a list of the account numbers, the name of each of those account numbers, how much money is in each account, and the transactions that took place in each of those accounts to get that money in there or out of there. That's all a ledger is. Um, so Bitcoin is one ledger that everybody can see. So because everybody's watching it, you can't really change it because if you if I try and go change it, um, everybody knows that I changed it. So everybody realizes that's not real. Um, with a with a bank like the digital dollar today, because dollars are digital, every bank has its own ledger, its own list. Your name, your account number, your information, the amount of money you have, where that money came from. When transactions happen between banks, they have to reconcile their ledgers and they say, okay, I'm sending money to you. So I'm marking off that this money came out of all these accounts and is going over to you and you mark that off and we make sure that we're you know clean and even with each other. Today, there's what, 4,200 ledgers across the United States alone, because that's how many banks there are. And, um, and so it would be very difficult to make a transition. So we need, if you're like planning, we need a, uh, one unified ledger CBDC in the future, we need to consolidate those. So think small bank failures absorbed by the big banks. Now, if we can get those ledgers down to 100, 50, 10 large consolidated ledgers, then now that's very easy to take those and we can just unify them under the central bank and say, okay, now we have one unified ledger together. Uh, the reason why I described it that way is because there won't be any change for the individual. Like you'll still log into your bank. If your little bank fails and you move to Chase, then obviously you, you've got to log into Chase now instead of your uh, little local bank. Um, so, so that would be a change. Other than that, there's not going to be a difference. There's not going to be a change. It's still going to be a dollar. It's still going to be digital. You're still going to have an app. You're still going to make payments. Initially, though, it'll just come with some benefits. It's like maybe it's universal basic income, maybe it's instant payments, maybe it's uh, easier uh, easier ways to apply for a loan. Maybe who, who knows what the benefits will be. Um, but uh, again, it won't be any change that people will notice. It'll likely just be little changes in the infrastructure behind the scenes that they do over a period of years, and then before we know it, it's just it's just there. Right, and it'd be hard to transition to a system like that. To your point. Um, and so Bronson, I've talked a little bit about this and how would it take something overnight that would cause, you know, the government to wake up and go, hey, this is our opportunity to do this. Or is it something that would happen gradually over time? Do you think it's going to be something more sudden? I'm curious. It seems like that's the direction where things are going. This Everything's becoming more digitized. There are a lot of advantages to it, a lot of efficiencies. I couldn't imagine like how easy taxes would be if they tracked yeah. every dollar I spent. Uh, so would you see it being something slow played out over time or something that happens quickly? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it could be either one of those, absolutely. So it could be like that original scenario that I described where there's a massive crisis, 
you know, where everything starts to collapse, you know, similar, maybe even greater than what people thought, you know, in March of 2020. And, um, and on the back of that, they say, hey, download this app from the Fed, you'll get your money, you can spend it at any business that also has that app from the Fed. And overnight, they try and transition people into just, you know, a banking app at the Fed. Um, that would be very difficult. The infrastructure for onboarding, what, 300 million new accounts into one unified ledger. I just don't think uh, without a big enough crisis, it's that that's very difficult. So I think the more likely scenario is they build it all out behind the scenes. Um, and then maybe they just need congressional approval um, to flip on the switch for all of the, you know, tyrannical controls. Or maybe once it's built, then Congress says, okay, now we're, we're taking over. Um, but uh, I think the more likely scenario is a slow, gradual build out behind the scenes that nobody really uh, anticipates. So, you know, counter thought to this as well as, you know, we do a lot of ATM machine investing. So familiar with the uh, with the kind of the unbanked or the non-bank sector. It's uh, the FDIC had a report in 2021 that said 4.5 percent of households in the U.S. Not a single person has a bank account and another 20 percent are using things like, um, you know, payday loans and pawn shops and credit card debt. And I just wonder, you know, to roll this out, that would kind of steamroll a lot of those folks, I guess it would just push them to go digital. But there's reasons why these people are, you know, either they're immigrants or they're working for cash on the table. Now, even like a, like a place like Florida has, you know, uh, has outlawed central bank digital currencies. There's enough awareness around this now. But I think when you sneak it in with like Fed now and different things, do you, I mean, it, I guess, like you said, it has to be a big enough crisis for it to like, we've got to go with this extreme measure, right? To like, oh, this is the way to save the economy or something. And it was like, okay, we're giving up. Like, because when that happens, I mean, that's the time, right? Where we go to the streets with our signs and our pitchforks and say no more, right? <laughs> because that's, yeah. and once you lose that, you lose all your freedom. Like it's all gone. We're China now, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think if they tried to come out today and uh, and roll out a full-blown CBDC, it would just it absolutely not work. Um, and so I, I do think it kind of has to be one of those two options where people, you know, take the handout of, because, you know, e even though it has a handcuff because of the crisis, um, or it just gets built out slowly behind the scenes like they're doing very incrementally right now with Fed now. I mean, last year at the end of the year, they did a 12 week pilot program with the big banks, just the big six banks um, of a CBDC, a full blown CBDC. So they did a parallel virtual system of all the transactions that were taking place with these six banks, uh, imitating what if we were using a full blown CBDC. Um, and so they are slowly testing, slowly researching, slowly trying to get this thing built out behind the scenes. Um, but you're right, if they try and just roll it out right now, and there's a, especially a big change from people needed, I don't think it would happen. But like like to your point, like the unbanked thing, it's like they, they could offer some very good, uh, easy um, advantages that get people on board. Um, uh, very easily, like the like the reason why a lot of people don't have uh, banks is because they don't trust banks. Um, maybe it's because they don't have the identification needed. Maybe it's because the, you know whatever the reason is, maybe their address. Whatever. One reason too is there's people with like a divorce settlement or a judgment of some sort of legal thing, even not just low income but higher income that don't put it in the bank because it'll be garnished. So there's there's some issues of that as well. Um, but anyway, there, there's this whole like unbanked sec sector that's just it thrives, even though like the more digital we become, the more yeah. like analog or paper or some of the, you know, some people are becoming, which is interesting. Yeah. And, and I, I actually think, you know, this is probably a discussion for another time, but that that you just described right there is one of the reasons why it will ultimately fail, even if they do have a rapid adoption from, you know, whatever way they choose at the beginning, it ultimately is destined to fail because the more exercise you control over a um, uh, system governed by complexity dynamics, the more top-down control you assert over a system like that, the more fragile it becomes and more susceptible to collapse. Um, and uh, and so it is ultimately destined for failure. One of those aspects is because it pushes people into the black market. And then the feedback of information of transactions happening outside their control don't get recorded. They can't make the right decisions about the flow of resources. Therefore, they make incorrect decisions that that uh destabilize it so i think it is destined for failure it's not permanent uh it would just it'll just be painful <laughs> so joe brown we've got to wrap up here because of yeah. time uh we could talk for hours i do want 60 seconds on knowing all that uh as an investor 
what are uh, things to consider in light of what's here and what's coming? That's what everybody think wants to know too. Yes. Okay. 60 seconds. Uh, number one, uh, I'm, I'm going to go with a portfolio allocation approach here. Number one, uh, about 30% in, uh, in, uh, in, in business. Uh, business is where you're going to get your capital appreciation from uh, long-term over time. Uh, I like about 30% in real estate because that's where you get your cash flow, you get the tax benefits, you get the debt benefits, massive benefits there. Um, number three, I like about 30% of my money in reserves because when things crash, when things go on sale, I want to be able to buy them. I don't want to have to be forced to sell something at the bottom. I want to be able to ride out the storms. This is a very old portfolio allocation strategy from well over a thousand years ago. Um, the extra 10%, I like to use for things like half of that in uh, Bitcoin because that is censorship resistant money. It looks like the elites are starting to slowly uh, realize that and get on board with that and allow it to happen. And um, uh, I like to have about 20% of my uh, reserves in gold. Again, censorship resistant, inflation resistant. It, purchasing power stays the same through inflation or deflation um, and stored overseas. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the country on earth that everybody has been fleeing to throughout all of human history has been different. Uh the, the most attractive place on earth always changes. Um, and for a while, people have fled other tyrannical regimes to come to the United States. Well, it's possible that at some point things change and you want to have wealth waiting for you somewhere in another country. And so I like to have uh, things distributed outside just in case something happens. At the end of the day, I can always sell it use the cash here anyway. So I like to have things spread out and that way I keep money outside of the system, but enough inside so that if I'm wrong, things keep on going the way they always have been. I still get wealthy. Joe Brown, thanks so much for being with us today. You have so much to share about a lot of topics, really appreciate your mind, the way it uh, processes information and just can, can break all this down in a very simple way. How can people follow what you're doing? Yeah. Thank you for having me again. Uh, YouTube is the main place. Heresy Financial is my channel. Uh, Twitter is the second place at Heresy Financial. Um, and then uh, I have a membership, uh, Heresy Financial University, where I uh, build out a bunch of courses for financial literacy, if anybody's interested in that. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joe. Thanks, uh, Joe Coleman. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah, I look forward, to, uh, uh, look forward to seeing you again, Joe. Thank you. All right, Joe Coleman, thanks for being here, man. First uh, time as a guest host. How was it for you? It was great. I feel like um, a lot of questions that, you know, when you listen to like Federal Reserve, FOMC, um, debriefs and, and all of that, there's a lot of things that I want to talk with, with people who like, I can't talk to my girlfriend about it, can't talk to my family about it. So it's cool to, I feel like Joe is um, definitely the, the most knowledgeable person that I've talked with about current events um, happening with the Federal Reserve. So thank you for, for inviting me. Oh, of course, you know, it's amazing. You brought up a good point. When you get around really smart people, even if you end up with a different opinion than where you started or the, you know that you have a different opinion than they do, you learn something. Like I learned something today. We were talking about central bank digital currencies. We we're talking about just his allocation strategy of you know real estate and businesses and Bitcoin and money overseas. Uh, it's just interesting because you know he's there's a guy who really spends a lot of time just thinking through different scenarios. Uh, what's your thought on some of the what he said about central bank digital currency and kind of the uh, what do you call it the tyrants? uh wet dream which is <laughs> i was i was wondering when that was going to come off again <laughs> that's like wow that's yeah. Like, yeah, what did uh what did you think yeah. about well, it it sounds like he still thinks it's a dream which <laughs> yeah, is good yeah. uh, so yeah you know i i feel like it's one of those topics that um everybody loves learning about it's kind of like cryptocurrency because it's you know you want to watch where the puck is going so you're not too late so you're you know in the right place um and and so i th his thoughts were 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 really interesting in regards to like okay so what are the implications of all of this um and what what would it mean but it's kind of hard to to say like okay here's where we are now and then here's where we're in the future we're, we could have this kind of orwellian like future and and what what would bring us there it's all just conjecture right so but it's really it's really interesting to to talk about i don't know did you feel like there's certain things that you know as a result of this conversation you think well i'll prepare a little bit differently or kind of you know new insights into central digital bank currency specifically um you know i didn't think it really kind of changed any of my approach it was interesting he brought up it up as well the idea that like fiscal policy versus monetary policy are different things and no matter what 
they say they're going to do, I mean, we're still going to be spending $2 trillion a year over what we bring in, and that's foreseeable for the next 10 years. So there's there's some conflicts there that, you know, are in place. But anyway, there, there's a lot we could dig into here. I just think, you know, great conversation, great time to, to be able to review that. And if you're watching this on video, uh, I was just out at his place recently in Colorado Springs. He's got a bunch of chopped wood in his living room there. Yes, I don't have gold, but I have wood. <laughs> so, hey, good, good luck uh, keeping warm with that. <laughs> Play Settlers of Catan, that board game, right? If you've got wood, you've got trees, you've got you know bricks, and maybe more gold may not be that valuable, right? It's just uh, something beautiful to look at. So uh, awesome, Joe. I appreciate you being here. I just want to say thank you to our audience for, for listening in. Um, you know, If you are interested in learning more, follow uh, Joe Brown at Heresy financial great channel also if you're interested in uh, how to use inflation to your advantage if inflation officially at the time of recording this is three percent it doesn't feel like three percent to me but that's what they're saying so we should feel better and uh you know just live totally free there but we have a guide which is how to use inflation to your advantage i'm, I'm under the belief that at the time of recording uh end of july early august it is uh closer to 10 or 12 percent or higher uh, but anyway, we have a guy just using some non-traditional strategies. You can check that out at bronsonequity.com. But uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Joe, for being here. Thanks to our audience as well. Look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Mailbox Money. You've been listening to the Mailbox Money podcast. For more free resources, articles, and videos, go to bronsonequity.com. There you can download your copy of the special report, The Single Best Investment Strategy During and After a Pandemic. None of the information shared here is an offer to buy a specific investment, and this is for educational purposes only. Consult your financial, legal, and tax professionals and use your own common sense before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune in next time for more Mailbox Money.